do very much because it doesn't have any method of hybridizing. It's not, you know, the nucleotides are already connected to each other. So how is that going to then attach to the DNA or attach to the mRNA and uh, block transcription or translation? Um, that, that was the theory at the time, and it didn't make sense that double-stranded DNA would do that. Uh, so here's the other half of that table. Um, here's the big experiment was the UNC-54. Um, a lot of interesting results from that. Uh, th here, this is where they found out for sure introns do not affect it. So that was kind of a blow to the idea that uh, this happened at the level of transcription um, because introns are cut out. So that uh, so if it's not affecting it when it's only on introns, then it's probably not going to happen at uh, transcription. Uh, and also the promoter uh, did not have an interference effect. So uh, that pretty much, uh, it didn't fully rule it out, but that said, you know, there's a pretty good chance that it's not happening at the level of transcription. It's more likely happening afterwards uh, on the mRNA. Um, all of the exons worked. Uh, they spent a lot of time trying to figure out why uh, exon 1 through 5 here had a slightly different phenotype than the null mutant. Um, I didn't actually find out what the difference is, but um, they did notice that it did have an effect, so it was doing something. Um, the uh, HLH uh, lumpy dumpy, uh, that's kind of a fun phenotype. Uh, Basically, that just meant that the, uh, the larvae were uh, shaped wrong. So uh, normally these worms are a nice, smooth uh, line with pointed ends. And these lumpy, dumpy ones are kind of bloated and look like they're full of cellulite or something. Uh, they're just, they're kind of a little bit fluffy like popcorn. Um, so. Uh, you can see here that they also saw that phenotype uh, when they had the double-stranded RNA on the exons. Uh, the intron did nothing, uh, and the single-stranded RNA sense and antisense did almost nothing as well. Um, and then uh, this part of the table here, uh, these myo3 with GFP are the artificial genes in that mutant. Um, I'll talk about that on a later slide because it's a lot easier to see it visually from one of the other figures in the paper than from this table. Uh, this was from the, uh, the Nobel acceptance speech, uh, and I really liked this for visualization a lot better than anything in the paper. Uh, you can see there the entire first bit here, all of these columns, are double-stranded DNA at different concentrations. So the red means that you are getting an interference phenotype, uh, and each uh, bar in each of these groups is a time uh, after they've done the injection. So they'll take the double-stranded DNA, they have a very, very tiny needle that they inject it into the animal, then they take the offspring of that animal and look at the phenotype that they're getting from that. So uh, zero to six hours, uh, all the way through 56 hours, and you can see that at the highest concentration, you get a lot of interference, and it sticks around for quite a while. And even at the lowest uh, concentration, you still get a fair amount of interference. Then you go to these anti-sense and sense single-stranded RNAs, and notice the concentration here. Uh, that's 30 or three three million six hundred thousand, and the highest concentration here is 1,800,000. So even at a concentration that's about double, they're getting less RNA interference from the antisense strand. Uh, this was really, really surprising. Nobody expected this at all. Um, and then, of course, their control, um, you can see, looked very close to how their single-stranded RNA did. Uh, so, they've done all of this work, and they still have no mechanism. Um, they still don't know what's going on. Uh, one of the people that was actually doing the work, uh, Sam Driver in uh, Melo's lab, 
uh, was actually kind of new to the whole injecting the worms with RNA. And uh, because it's so precise, uh, he wasn't very good at getting accurately uh, pinpoint, uh, accurately injection, injecting the genetic material. So um, the people who they had learned to do this from were always injecting the RNA into the gonads uh, because then you're looking at the offspring of those worms and you know you might as well inject it right where you expect to need it. Uh, but they found that it doesn't matter where they injected it. They could inject it just about anywhere in the animal and it would move uh, to the gonads and, and to the children and uh, you'd see the exact same phenotypes. So uh, that was another thing that was interesting is not only uh, are these what are usually large charged mo molecules like DNA don't transfer between cells, but here they're seeing the effect of this uh, throughout the entire animal, not only in the injected animal itself, but also in the progeny. Uh, so here's the slide that makes it a lot easier to visualize the GFP uh, animals. Um, these, this is the control here. You can see that normally this mutant animal has a GFP that's expressing both in the nucleus of every cell as well as uh, in this blow up you can see the little dots where the mitochondria have the GFP as well. Um, those big washed out areas are the nucleus and then there's the mitochondria. Um, but then when they r put in RNA that is complementary, double strand RNA that's complementary to the GFP, all of a sudden the interference makes all of that GFP disappear. So you're getting no expression of the GFP here um, except in the vulva. Uh, so that was another thing they didn't understand. Uh, why is this only happening there? Um, and, and like one cell there. This is a blow up of, of two of the lucky cells that managed to still express. Um, and during this time, they're, they're looking at the amount that they're having to put in and comparing that to the number of cell divisions afterwards. And they're seeing that, you know, there's only a few molecules per cell uh, at this point of the originally, of the originally injected double-stranded RNA. So this is a really, really potent thing, and it must be mediated by something other than just the RNA itself uh, binding to mRNA or to DNA and blocking transcription because there's just not enough of it to, over, to do that consistently. Um, and then this was really interesting as well. Here, they inst uh, the nuclear version of the GFP protein that was uh, in these mutant animals would uh, go to the nucleus and have, uh, it had a LAC-Z protein sequence uh, attached onto that. So uh, instead of uh, getting rid of the GFP with an RNA, they used an RNA that was complementary only to that LAC protein. So uh, that effectively inhibited the RNA that was going to the nucleus, but not going the RNA that was going to the mitochondria because it didn't have the latches. So uh, in this animal, um, again, the, the vulva there is unaffected, but the rest of the animal has GFP that's lighting up its mitochondria, but not the nucleus. Um, so that was interesting, but they still didn't know what was going on. Um, so they tried it in embryos. And uh, here they have a mutant embryo um, and a regular embryo, mutant embryo, uh, both as control. And uh, the mutant embryo has a, me a different MEX3 um, that turns it black. So uh, then they added a single-stranded RNA and a double-stranded RNA uh, to see what would happen if we try to interfere with this MEX. And uh, you can see that the double-stranded RNA shuts it down completely. So uh, it, you basically have zero mRNAs from the uh, MEX gene when you're blocking it with double-stranded DNA. Uh, but the single-stranded RNA, or with d double-stranded RNA, 
the single strand RNA uh, did interfere with it a little bit, but uh, not doing that much. So um, better just publish. <laughs> so they've done all these they've they've done all these experiments. They've found that double stranded RNA is definitely interfering, um, but they still don't have a mechanism. Um, but uh, you know, th at this point, we better just publish. Um, it's a very powerful tool. They recognize that immediately. You know, you can do things with this that previous RNA interference technology with the single stranded. Uh, you know, it's not shutting things down. It's completely so. This is a rea really great tool for seeing what genes do, because you can shut down specific genes and then see what the phenotype is. Um, it's potent. It lasts a while. Um, so they wrote up their paper and, and went ahead and published it. Um, and I'm going to go on here uh, to the epilogue. Um, uh, we've learned a lot about RNA research since then, uh, about RNA interference. And in fact, uh, Andrew and Craig's lab have both done a lot to find the mechanisms after this paper was written. Um, uh, if you remember from your molecular and cell biology classes, uh, the cell naturally produces some RNA that does interference on itself. Um, and that's usually mediated by a uh, dicer, which chops up the RNAs into little pieces. Uh, that gets grabbed by Argonaut, and uh, which connects to the risk here. Um, and eventually you have this whole complex uh, with risk and the uh, little pieces of the RNA that match the mRNA you're trying to interfere with. Uh, and they'll bind to the mRNAs and cause the mRNAs to be cleaved. Um, so uh, they were sort of right that you know, the RNAs are uh, matching to sequences that are complementary to them. Uh, and they're causing them to be cleaved. If they don't match quite right, uh, you notice there's some little bumps here where they don't quite match, um, then the whole thing just gets degraded instead of uh, just being snipped up. But um, this uh, Argo and risk complex are part of why you have the uh, lasting uh, RNA because the it, it holds onto it and stabilizes it, prevents the cell from breaking it down, and it can uh, cause multiple mRNAs to be chopped up. Um, so as a result of this, uh, Andrew Fire finally got to go to Stanford. He's a professor there now. Uh, uh, Milo got involved in a lot of RNA interference-based biotechnology. Um, he's on the board of directors or a, an investor in a bunch of different biotech companies, um, all trying to do something with RNAi. Uh, so far, there haven't really been any therapies developed that, are, that have gotten out to mass market with this, which is uh, really kind of surprising because it's such a powerful tool. Um, uh, but it's also kind of dangerous. Um, they won a lot of awards, including a Nobel Prize in 2006. Um, they won the National Academy of Sciences Award and also were voted into the Academy. Uh, and then they won all of these prizes and a bunch more. Um, it's, they've really gotten a lot of press for this, and, and deservedly so. Well, turns out that as they were looking into the mechanism more after they wrote this paper, they found that 